I am uh, six and a half years older than my younger brother, and that was a big enough gap that I can remember him learning to speak. Um, he's the first person I remember learning to speak and saying all the adorable things that people learning to speak say. Because I, I guess when we're the same age, when we're doing it ourselves, we don't appreciate how adorable we all are. <laughs> but I was old enough with, with uh, my brother, and I could tell he wasn't doing it right. And it was <laughs> cute, right? Um, one of my very favorite moments is when he crawled up in bed one Saturday morning, and he took out a penny that he had found somewhere, and he held up the penny to my dad, who's very nearsighted. So he, he like had to hold it like right here. He's like, call him a name, pointing at the bust of Abraham Lincoln. Call him a name. What he was asking, of course, is like, who is on the penny? Right? But he didn't know how to say whose image is represented by the engraved bust on the obverse side of this monetary <laughs> instrument. So he said, call him a name. And of course, my dad replied correctly. Uh, we all know it's Abraham Lincoln. In much the same way, in today's gospel reading, um, Jesus uh, takes a denarius and tells the Pharisees and the Herodians to call him a name. Um, or as it is in our text, whose head is this? And whose title? Now, my brother asked the question because he wanted to know. Like, he wanted more knowledge about his world. He didn't know whose head was on the penny, and so he was trying to learn about the world around him. Jesus presumably doesn't have that problem, right? He knows whose head is on the denarius, but he too wants knowledge. He too wants to learn, and what he wants is to learn about the hearts of the people he is conversing with about coins. He wants to know how they understand the world. Now, narrowly understood, um, Jesus has been presented with sort of a political, theological question about taxes and whether or not it is lawful to pay them. To be very clear, the lawful here is like lawful in a religious sense. The Romans were abundantly clear that it was lawful in the Roman sense, the kind that came with swords. So like they were going to get paid. The question is, how do we understand it religiously? And it's a yes or no question to which Jesus replies with a question. And he asked for a coin and asked whose head is on the coin. Um, and upon the answer, the emperors, he says, then give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperors and to God the things that are God's. And they went away and basically everyone ever since has decided that it's lawful to pay taxes, particularly the people whose job is levying taxes have decided that that's what Jesus meant. It's lawful to pay taxes. And uh, the thing about it is, Jesus never says that exactly. What he says is that to figure out what to do with your money, you first have to figure out who it belongs to. Decide who it belongs to. Now, our translation uh, this morning says, whose head is this? Because we know that the things that end up on coins are people's heads. Nobody has an honorary elbow on the front of their coin, right? Like, uh, but the actual Greek doesn't say whose head, it says whose likeness, whose image is this? So I want you to think about this scenario. Jesus, remember the son of God, through whom all things were created, as we say, including human beings who were made in the image of God, Jesus is holding this engraved relief of a man and saying, whose image is this? Now, of course it is Caesar's. But by virtue of Caesar being a man, it is also the image of God. That coin, which someone in the crowd had earned and had saved and had protected, that coin is, in the image sense, just as much God's as it is Caesar's. It depends on how you think about it. And I think that's why Jesus doesn't say, yes, pay your taxes. But he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Like what we do with our stuff, the question about our stuff is always, who do we think it belongs to? Can we see through the Lincolns and the Jeffersons and the Roosevelts and the Washingtons and the Benjamins on the front of our money and see the image of God that they all share? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to God's what is God's. 
Now, I listed some of the presidents on our money, but obviously, even for Jesus, it's not the literal picture stamped onto the material that matters. It's how we think about the wealth we have. If we realize that some of what we own must be God's, well, that changes then where we must give it, right? If we have to give to God what is God's. Now, of course, the way we actually think about our own money is that our own face is stamped on it, right? <laughs> Nobody actually has that money, but that's generally the way we tend to think about it. Um, it's not ever ours in that sense, but, it, but in what sense is it God's? This is the question. Now, hopefully, the Bible has established a standard for how we think about this. It's called the tithe, and generally speaking, it's 10%. And our reading from Deuteronomy is one of the places that speaks about a tithe. This is not one of the sections, though, that does the math. Uh, it's not worried about the math. Um, if you remember back to when Chad read it, the first half of the reading was actually about how the Israelites had to destroy all the places where the idols had been worshipped first. This is because instructions about generosity are questions, instructions about stuff. And the first question with our stuff is always, who do we think it belongs to? So before God gives any, any instruction about giving, he says, look, you've got to get, clear all this other stuff out of the way. And then, once the Israelites sort that out, then there's the instructions about giving and giving back, um, including the giving of the tithe. Now, I mentioned the biblical tithe is 10%, uh, and I know we're not all there. I know we're not all there because when the CFO of Fossil uh, was here, he was a member of St. Andrews and the Treasurer, and he ran the numbers based on the demographic statistics and said our budget would be six times higher if everyone tithed. But so my point isn't just the 10% here today, actually. I think um, the Bible's consistent on that point, but I wonder if the most important part about the tithe is not the 10, but the percent sign. Because to think of 10% or 5% or even 1% of everything that I have being God's is a different mindset than deciding that 500 or 1,000 or 5,000 of it is God's. A percentage means that some part of everything is God's. It leaves nothing that's just ours or just Caesar's for that matter. Some part is God's of all of it. Just like you're not going to get the pepper out of that bowl of salt. Now, there are, for churches, there are practical reasons why churches like to encourage percentage-based giving. Like, for one thing, provided our employers and the Social Security Administration are on top of things, it automatically adjusts for inflation, um, which is helpful. Um, it also makes it easy and guilt-free to change your giving when your income changes. So, like, when you fill out the um, intention of giving card this year, you'll have to pick a number. We can't write a percent. Um, but if that number changes over the course of the year, if your income goes down, then you just give less. Like, it's the same percentage. It's the same number. There's no guilt or shame in changing your pledge. Or if you get a new job that pays more, you give more, right? But so there are these practical reasons. This is true. But frankly, like here, Sunday morning in the middle of worship, I don't care so much about practical reasons. The reasons I'm willing to spend part of a sermon on percentage-based giving is because this biblical model of giving makes us better disciples, makes us more aware of God in every single moment of our lives. Giving is not, all, Christian giving, is not ultimately a matter of supporting an organization, but about building up our faith and our relationship with God. So even if you are here this morning and you have already decided a number rather than a percentage, right? you know what the number is uh, for what you intend to give to St. Andrew's next year, then I urge you to do the math and figure out what percentage of your income that entails. Just figure it out so you know in your head. And then think about your giving over the course of the next year in those terms. Think about every dollar that goes through your hands or through your bank account as though it were some percent God's. Percentage-based giving makes everything holy in the same way that every breath we take has oxygen. You know this, right? The air is like 78% or so nitrogen, 21% oxygen. Of the remaining 1%, like 90% of that is argon. But like try taking a breath of just oxygen or just nitrogen. 
but you can't do it. Whether you have a little tiny bit of air or an AT&T stadium's worth of air, right? apart from really specialized tools, there's no way you're going to separate the oxygen from the nitrogen and the argon and all the other stuff in there, right? Everything has some oxygen, just like everything has some God. So when we give according to the biblical model of percentage-based giving, then everything we have has God's image on it. Whether you make $100 or $10,000 or $100,000 or a million dollars, some part of every bit of it belongs to God. And this transforms the way we relate to God. I know this personally. I know it because Stephanie and I made this transition to percentage-based giving nearly a decade and a half ago. It helps us continually answer the question, like, who's on my money, essentially? Whose image is this? To whom does my stuff belong? Now, we're in the middle of our annual stewardship campaign. Like, this is a sermon moment where, frankly, like, I'm trapped. I can hear the cynical take about this in my own head. Like, is it better for St. Andrews if everyone who was a member here tithed? Sure, it is. And I'm also not going to stand up here and lie and say that I don't think and pray and worry and fret about making our budget, about paying for our staff and our building and our ministries. Like, that's all true. You've got me there. I, I really do want to make sure that St. Andrews is the sort of place where people will go and write on Facebook like this, my quotes, on what was one of my hardest days, I felt more loved than ever. I'm blessed and thankful beyond measure. Like, yes, I want us to keep being that place. But I don't preach, even in stewardship season, for budgets. Not even budgets that make life-changing ministry possible. When I preach, I try, and I know I do so halting and failingly, but I try to communicate the gospel and its life-changing power. And I know, because the Bible tells me so, because my own life shows it, and because of countless of your examples here, that the belief that some part of every dollar belongs to God transforms our walk of faith. It changes how we think about our stuff and then changes how we think about our God and his presence and his generosity and his grace in our lives. So give to Caesar what is Caesar, give to God what is God's. That was Jesus' answer, but it was not a tax question. He was pointing to the heart of the matter. To whom does the stuff we have belong? What part of it is God's? How much then do we give to God? Having acknowledged that whoever's face is stamped or printed on our money is a person made in his image. And once you can't unsee God, you can't unsee his generosity. And you can't help but give back.